All right, we'll go in three, two, one. Hello and welcome in to the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports. Really excited about the episode we have coming your way today. We're going to talk to Shayon J. Raja, who covers college football for CBS Sports. Um, really knowledgeable about the Big 12 and just the college football landscape in general as we kind of dissect Kansas, realignment, everything kind of heading into the 2022 football season. But before we dive in, Shayon, how has your week been so far? Not too bad. Definitely less busy than last week in the past couple of weeks. Uh, you know, things have been a little bit more quiet on the open front. So trying to enjoy a little bit of a, of a respite before we really get into things. Yeah, it's we're, we're just talking about before we got on that Pac-12 Media Days come up this next week, and then all of a sudden for the beat guys like myself, it's fall camp, and then next thing you know, you blink and it'll be December. Um, so it's going to be a busy time, but let's go back about a little over a week when, you know, first time we met at Big 12 Media Days there in Dallas. Um, we'll start with some key football talk, and then we'll get to some big picture realignment stuff at the end. For you listening to Lance Leipold, um, his introductory press conference, kind of listening to some of the players throughout. I guess what were just some of the things that caught your attention now going into year two? Obviously, KU didn't make it down to Dallas last year due to weather. So first time kind of listening to him in person, just kind of overall impressions of him and, and what you heard. I think more than anything else, like, like you mentioned, obviously Lance Leifold wasn't able to make it last year, but it, it was obvious to me how comfortable he felt. It felt like this is a guy who's been in the job for a year, who understands some of the issues facing Kansas. Uh, he spoke very confidently, very thoroughly. And I felt like the whole team kind of had just like a very resolved feel to them. Uh, obviously, Kansas over the past decade, uh, you know, it's been a rough go of it. But, uh, you know, it really did feel like you started to feel some of Lance Leipold flowing through that program a little bit. You heard it in the way that I think players answered questions as well. And I think that whenever you're trying to do sort of this wholesale rebuild, right, the biggest thing is to try and fix that culture. And that's something that is a buzzword that, you know, people like to say a lot but I think that what it really means more than anything else is having somebody like Lance Leipold flowing through your program you know you want to hear it uh, you want to hear similar answers whenever players are answering questions you want to hear the coach kind of be on the same page with everybody else and, and I think we really started to see some of that um, you know I think that at this point, you know, Lance Leipold certainly knows what he's up against, but I think that he has a better understanding of how to maybe address some of these issues on the football field than maybe some of the, the predecessors that I've heard before. You know, I I've been around for the Beatty years. I've been around for the Les Miles years. I've been going to Big 12 Media Days through all of that. Uh, and, and I do feel like this was one of the more professional media days that a Kansas coach has given over, you know, the, the time that I've been covering the Big 12. Yeah, Professional, I think, is the right word. I think you think about the way that Lance Leipold runs his program as well, and you mentioned culture. I think listening to some of the players, really interested to hear their perspective on how the culture has changed. And, you know, I've experienced obviously covering Iowa State for a few years, and Campbell always talked about player-led leadership. And that has been the key word for Lance Leipold here early on is kind of the player-led leadership. And I think you're starting to see some of that where – you know, Kenny Logan, the safety, told a story about how Craig Young, the Ohio State transfer, held a teammate accountable during practice. It wasn't a coach that had to do it. It was the player that did it. And I think you're right. Like the professionalism, everyone on the same page in terms of the culture, not really giving out win totals. I thought that was something that sometimes players and coaches alike can get caught into is, hey, we're going to win this many games. We're going to win this game, blah, blah, blah. Like for all of them, it was very much based on improvement. And I think improvement is what you saw kind of over the last few weeks of last season as well, right? The last three weeks, you beat Texas, you go and play TCU West Virginia close. You know, for you, I guess, is that when you look at the big picture for KU, is that the part of last season that has really stuck with you? Is it the overall improvement? I guess going back to last season and now heading into this offseason, what were some of the things that kind of stuck with you that made you feel like, all right, you know, Lance Leipold does have this thing going in the right direction? 
No, I think that that has to be such a big part of it, right? Uh, you know, one thing that we talked about, and I'm sure that we'll get into is, in my mind, I kind of have this idea of progression when you're building a program, right? You Your first year, you want to kind of figure out what's going on, what you want to be, what your players are able to be at whatever spot you're at. And then year two, you want to be competitive. And then year three, you want to win some of those competitive games. And for Kansas, you know, I, I kind of throw in a, another year on the front, right? Because it is just very much figure out what the heck is going on. Obviously, uh, you know, just because of the hole that Kansas has been in. But we saw some aspects of what I would consider a traditional year one or even early year two at the end of the year one, right, for Kansas, which is not something that I think uh, anybody really expected. Everybody's going to point to that Texas game, and for good reason, of course, but but I really look at those other two games against West Virginia and against TCU and how competitive Kansas was in both of those two games. Uh, you know, they looked like a team that belonged. They looked like a real FBS Power 5 level program for those three games to close out the year. And, uh, you know, and I, I don't want to lower the bar for them by any means, but I think that that's what you have to do, right? You have to be able to go in. You have to be able to make big plays. You have to be able to run things that make sense within your system. Um, and, and I really like what they've been able to do from that perspective. You know, obviously, you have to keep it up. The, the schedule doesn't get any easier this upcoming year. But, um, but you know, I think that I still have that progression in my mind, right? Year one is a little bit of a throwaway, especially because of not having spring camp. You know, year two, I want to see a clear identity, even if it doesn't lead to wins. And hopefully by year three, there's some really competitive games and, and Kansas can kind of be causing some issues in the Big 12. Yeah, and I'm curious, too, from your perspective, you know, returning production. That's something that Kansas has a lot of this year. I think they're number one in the Big 12, and Bill Connolly is returning production rankings. And for a program like KU, I think to maintain continuity is huge. There wasn't a ton of that. I think you know some players stayed over between Les Miles and and Lance Leipold, but you lost players like Marcus Harrison, Dejon Terry to SEC teams. Like you lost players, and then this offseason, you look at the players that have left the program. It's a lot of guys that are going to Group of Five programs, FCS programs. There's some players that still haven't found a place where they're going to play college football. And I'm curious for you, like returning production, you look at not having spring before last season, and now it's your first time having a full-blown, you know, all right, we get back in January, we do some weightlifting, then we're going to go into spring ball in February, March, and April, and then everyone gets a break. We'll come back for summer. Like how much do you feel like returning production has an impact for a team like Kansas where I think back to last year, the team I covered at Iowa State, returned everybody and fell flat on their face. I guess, how do you weigh something like that with a program like Kansas that hasn't necessarily had that, but also had such a wide gap for so much of last season in terms of competitiveness? Well, and I think that it's much more relevant for a program like Kansas, who's trying to build their way up to bowl eligibility, for example, than it does to competing for the Big 12, for example, right? Mm. I think that at that level, it's really, you know, yes, experience matters but also talent matters also different sort of things matter uh you know when i'm looking at a situation like kansas i think the biggest thing is it gives you the ability to be additive right it gives you the ability to add value to what was already there instead of having to kind of shuffle the cards a little bit and having to redo it all over again and uh, obviously you know we're going to get into it kansas brought in a great uh, transfer class as well a good mm -hmm. recruiting class as well um you know and so i really like what they're bringing back right it, i think that historically, it's kind of been, there have been a couple of stars that Kansas has had, guys who are potential all Big 12 type guys, right? But then it's kind of a mess underneath it. I think that one of Kansas's biggest issues has been building up that quality depth to where, you know, the, the first through fifth players are solid Big 12 players, but then you go like, 20 through 30 that that's where i think that kansas has really struggled over the years and so what i like about bringing back production and what i like about bringing back quality production more than anything else is, is i think that it does give kansas an opportunity to build that 20 through 30 that 40 mm. through 50 that 70 through 80 uh which i think is actually in a lot of ways where college football is decided you know i i don't think that Yes, Alabama has the two best players in the country right now, but they also have the best 20 through 25 in the entire country, right? I mean, that's what recruiting can do for you and what development does for you. So uh, I think that what returning production means for Kansas more than anything else is it means that you have options where if something doesn't work out, if 
Jalen Daniels isn't the guy at quarterback, if, you know, Kenny Logan doesn't have as good of a year as he had last year, you have guys who can step up and make up for some of those deficiencies. So you're not just wholly dependent on one or two players being absolute superstars. Yeah. And the depth thing I think is that that's a really good point because that has been the issue. And I think the scholarship numbers too, I don't think the removal of the incoming counter cap, that uh, 25 number, that helps KU out so much because they would have been capped of who they could have taken this spring in terms of the transfers. And yet now you see them taking a class that's going to be number 21 overall. Um, for those watching on YouTube, pulled up the, the transfer class right now. You know, you've got a good wealth of transfers, right? So you took five junior college players overall, 14, um, what you know, whatever you call four year college transfers, Dominic Pooney coming from uh, MIAA school in uh, central Missouri. But Overall, I think you look at these players and some are going to come in and start. That's going to be the expectation. I think others are going to come in and provide depth. I guess for you, when you look at overall kind of the names, was there any one, two, three players that you saw, whether it be December, the work that KU did then, or this spring, the work that they've done, kind of getting more of these depth pieces? I guess what are some of the guys that maybe stood out to you and feel like, yeah, that's going to be a difference maker for Kansas this fall? I mean, it's hard not to talk about Kai Thomas, right? Uh, coming in from Minnesota, uh, obviously was the starting running back for Minnesota once uh, Mohamed Ibrahim went down last year for them. I mean, that is a dude. That is somebody who comes right into the backfield and is a difference maker. And the funny thing about it too, like I remember when he transferred, I'm like, wait, did something happen to Devin Neal? Like, is he gone? Did I miss something? No, I mean, these guys are going to be teaming up. This is, I think, not just one of the best position combos that Kansas has. This is one of the better combos in, in the Big 12, I think, when it comes to running backs. I mean, they're going to be able to do so many different things. Uh, you know, just having two guys who are so durable, so fast. I, I think that they're both difference makers. And when you're running some of that wide zone offense stuff, I mean, having different guys who can give you slightly different looks, I think, can be such a huge deal for you. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it wouldn't have been my, my first uh, priority, I guess, if I was Kansas picking up another running back but if you can get somebody uh, obviously from the state of that quality I think that that's huge for them you know another one that that kind of stood out to me was Marvin Grant coming in from Purdue mm -hmm. at safety I mean look I, I think we all watched last year it was a lot of Kenny Logan trying to run around and cover everybody uh and I think to have another safety in there who's going to be able to to play at a power five level and be a contributor I mean this has been one of the most existential issues for Kansas over the years right I mean they've had some good linemen come through they've had some good linebackers come through but uh, but defensive back has historically been a huge issue for them so mm -hmm. to have two guys especially who I think can cover up some mistakes on the back end uh, I, I mean I think that's huge for them and I think that so much about Kansas this year is going to be can you limit some of the big explosive stuff so that you can just run your offense? I, I think that he's the kind of guy who's going to be able to fill up some of those gaps and, and hopefully just keep Kansas in games a little bit longer, because I think that the longer that Kansas stays in games, uh, I mean, obviously the, the more likely they are to, to pick off a couple of them. Yeah. And we'll get to that here in a second, but I love that you brought up Marvin Grant and Kenny Logan. That was something that, Talking to him at media days, like he made it abundantly clear he does not want to have 113 tackles this season. Like, he right. made that. He, I think he said two, three times that he wants to now go and lead the conference at interceptions and not be the only safety, I think, in the country with over 113 tackles. I think six pass breakups and multiple forced fumbles. I mean, you're right. It, it was the Kenny Logan show on defense a lot last year. And I think as a result of that, you know, you looked at KU going to improve that linebacker room too. You know, I think for me, Craig Young is the guy I'm most excited to watch this fall. I think you look at his athleticism. It's just a type of guy that Kansas just hasn't had. You mentioned the really good linebackers. You know, I think of Joe Deneen being one of them. Wasn't necessarily someone that's going to blow you away with his athleticism. But Craig Young comes in, I think he offers that. And I think overall, you see KU adapting this identity of we're going to play some Big Ten style of football almost, where we're going to run the ball on offense with Kai Thomas, Devin Neal, and heck, you've got Sevion Morrison, too, coming in from Nebraska. And then on defense, you've got more physical players now that can fill gaps, not allow big plays. And I'm curious for you, looking at the landscape of the Big 12 overall, I mean, I'll pull up the preseason poll right now, but when you look at the bottom right, Texas Tech, West Virginia, TCU, I think those are kind of the three games that I have my eye on. But you know, for you just starting big picture for the Big 12 as a whole, who are the teams you have an eye on saying, ooh, this might be a down year for them, a coaching change could come. Now, 
A lot of coaching changes last year, so maybe not as many spots for that. But just big picture for the Big 12, kind of what do you see this conference filling out in terms of maybe tiers or just the different levels of the program? Yeah, so I think I think that for me, um, you know, when you look at teams that I think Kansas could legitimately have a shot at, I really look at that West Virginia game in week two. Uh, it's going to be tough because it's so early in the year. I almost mm. feel like you'd want to get them later when they could be potentially going through a coaching change, for example. But uh, but I do think that West Virginia is going to be a pretty key game for them. Certainly in out of conference play, you know, you know the Duke game I think is going to be huge, and then Texas Tech, TCU. I think that these are games where you at least want to be competitive, even if you can't win them um you know what in terms of splitting the big 12 into tiers like this is going to be a crazy year I, I think that there could be as many as mm -hmm. five teams who compete to play in the big 12 championship game you know baylor oklahoma of course the top two they're, they're the teams who have won the conference most recently oklahoma state i think has a great shot of making their way back to the big 12 championship game after last year you know, Texas, I think that you have to look at what they've added, of course, and they're going to be a very offensive centric team, but they have some of the best playmakers in the country. So we'll kind of see what works itself out there. And I think that people are really sleeping on Kansas State. I, I mean, Kansas mm. State arguably has the best offensive and defensive player in the Big 12 with running back Deuce Vaughn and defensive end Felix and Aduke Izoma. So they had the most preseason all Big 12 selections with six. I don't know what people are missing on them. I, I mean, all of the, you know, you put together your preseason all Big 12 team, you put together your preseason uh, awards picks and everybody loves Kansas State, but then they think they're going to finish fifth. I, I don't think they're going to finish fifth. I think they're going to be pushing for 10 wins. Uh, I think they're going to be right there in that conversation at the end of the year. So I, I think that all five of those, uh, you know, if I had to, Take, I'd probably put Baylor, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State in the top tier. I think those other two in sort of a second tier. You know, for me, Iowa State's kind of in a tier of its own. I think they'll be a step ahead of TCU, but probably a step behind everybody else. Kind of TCU, West Virginia in a tier, and then Texas Tech, and then Kansas probably. So it's yeah. it could all work out any sort of way. Like, I mean, I, I really kind of feel like, you know, I, I would pick Kansas to finish 10th or 9th most likely, but almost anybody else can finish anywhere else. Like, it's going to be a crazy year, and I think it's going to make for one of the more fun years we've seen in a couple of years. Yeah, I'm excited for the Big 12 title race overall. I'm curious for you, though, like you look at the bottom kind of three or four of the Big 12, you know, under normal circumstances, I think you'd say, all right, Texas Tech, that seems like a game you might be able to win, but – but that coming on the road, you do get TCU at home, which is nice. And then, of course, that West Virginia game. Um, I'm curious just for you real quick on Texas Tech. With Joey McGuire and what they've done, I guess, where do you see them kind of fitting in? Because they're a team that in high school recruiting has done incredibly well, right? For so long, they were in the top 10, top 25. They might still be in the top 25. But just for you this offseason, where is Texas Tech at? And where are they kind of entering the season at in terms of the broader picture of the Big 12? You know, they're going to be a team of chaos more than anything mm -hmm. else this upcoming gear. You know, Zach Kitley comes over from Western Kentucky at offensive coordinator, and he's the guy who coordinated Bailey Zappi to have the most productive passing season in the history of college football. Now, I don't think it's going to be quite the same at Texas Tech. I, I think that that uh, Zach Kitley is pretty ad adaptable, and Texas Tech has some great tight ends. Uh, they've got two really, really good running backs, and they have a little bit of a dearth of talent at wide receiver relative to other years. So it's going to look a little different, but I think that they're going to be very dynamic offensively. The tough thing for them is that they're going to have to withstand that first half of their schedule because – they play North Carolina State and Houston in the non-conference slate, both of which could be top 15 teams in the country when they play them. Uh, they have a really tough early Big 12 slate. I believe they get Oklahoma and Texas really early, uh, along with Kansas State. They might start the year like one in five, mm -hmm. just because of how the schedule works itself out. Uh, and I don't think that'll be representative of their quality. I think they could be improved relative to last year and, and still kind of have a tough record. So I think they're more going to try to play spoiler for a lot of the rest of the year. I I know that they get Oklahoma in their last game of the year. They get Baylor at home, which I think is going to be a huge game for them. Uh, you know, and I'm curious to kind of see by the time that Kansas is playing them, are we seeing the best of Texas Tech or are we seeing the worst of Texas Tech? That's mm. going to, I think, play a, a big part in it, whether Joey McGuire is able to kind of keep things on track, which I, I think he understands what's in front of him. I think that's going to be a big focus is finishing the year strong because of what they have in front of them. But, uh, but look, First year head coach, uh, obviously things can go off the rails. And and certainly I think that uh, that Kansas also, I mean, Kansas beat Texas Tech a couple years ago, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Kansas also, I think, could just be able to win that game based on team quality. So uh, it'll be a really good one, I think. Uh, certainly, I wish that it was at home for Kansas instead of on the road. But uh, but certainly, I think that that's a game that uh, that Kansas should be competitive in. Yeah, and real quick, if Kansas finishes ninth in the Big 12, who finishes 10th? It's a good question. Uh, I, I think that probably Texas Tech would probably be the one who I think could finish 10th. Uh, I think West Virginia as well. Um kind of worried about them uh you know they, they have jt daniels coming in they've got graham harrell coming in at offensive coordinator uh but jt daniels has been hurt basically every year of his career uh graham harrell of course was just like go at usc and it's going to take some time i think to get things together and defensively they're going to be i think a lot softer than they've been the past mm. couple of years uh, even though neil brown was kind of like no that's that's what we do i i don't know you know it's, it's a lot to ask after losing 20 plus transfers across the roster. I mean, the most transferred team in the Big 12. So mm. I'm a little worried that the West Virginia thing might not work out and that uh, that by midseason, Neil Brown's maybe out of a job. And the other thing, too, is that Neil Brown has the worst schedule for a hot seat head coach that I've ever seen. He plays Pitt in the return of their backyard brawl rivalry in their first game on national TV on a Thursday. Everybody's going to be watching that game. And then in week three, he gets Virginia Tech with a first year head coach. If he were to lose those two games, that might be it. That that really might be it for him. So, uh, and certainly that Kansas game in week two, I think, will also be pivotal from that perspective for Neil Brown. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe things really start to click for West Virginia. But I certainly think that uh, that West Virginia and Texas Tech would probably be the two who would be right there in that conversation. Maybe things don't work out for TCU. I probably think that they're a little too talented to to fall into that range. But uh, again. I mean, somebody could easily fall off. Somebody could easily rise up, and, and it wouldn't surprise me that much. Hmm. I, I think it's a really good point with West Virginia. Like, it's the weird middle of two look-ahead games, right? The two rivalry games, and then you got Kansas in the middle. You know, JT Daniels, is that, are they going to hit the ground running? Like, that's the question I have. But let's switch to some realignment stuff before we get out of here. Um, when we were there in Dallas listening to Brett Yormark, what do you think? I was – relatively impressed obviously he, he can't lay out all right guys here's how we're gonna attack realignment but i think the aggressive stance you read about what your mark was like in his past stops aggressive is kind of his mantra and how he approaches things what were some of the things i guess stood out to you and just your overall first impression of him as commissioner i think more than anything else it was so obvious seeing him relative to Greg Sankey this week and Jim Phillips this week, uh, who are both longtime college administrators, just seeing somebody who's coming in from the outside, right? He was very branding focused. He was very marketing focused. He spoke very openly about the fact that his top priority was to maximize the upcoming television deal. Uh, you know, he, he didn't kind of give us the whole, you know, spiel and cover of, well, we want to, you know, build the best libraries possible, right? Like he was very clear that maximizing the value for the league was was going to take center stage. And I think that that sort of radical honesty was, a, uh, was I think, pretty enlightening to me. I think that also, like you kind of mentioned, his, uh, his statement that the Big 12 is open for business is going to be one that I think resonates over the next year. We'll see whether it means realignment. We'll see whether it means adding teams or, or what it ends up being. You know, talking to some sources over at, uh, at Big 12 Media Days, a lot of them do feel like if they make a move, they want to make sure it's additive, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that you look at the four teams that uh, that are being added to the league right now. All of them have huge growth opportunities by joining the Big 12. That's not going to be the case for every team. Um, you know, I, I specifically look out of those four schools that have been rumored from the Pac-12. I'm curious, you know, the, the Big 12 is going to have to evaluate Colorado and see whether this is a true long-term uh, plus for the conference to add a school like Colorado. You know, the Arizona schools, obviously, I think there's so much potential there, but are they going to invest at the level that they need to to be additive programs to the Big 12? All these issues are going to, I think, be circling right now in, in people's heads. Uh, and look, I, I don't think we're going to have answers on a few of these issues until Washington, Oregon, and Notre Dame ultimately make their decisions as well. Yeah, and those do seem like the three big dominoes. And I like your point, too, about the teams that the Big 12 is bringing in. It's a lot of schools with good football programs, and football is very much the driving force of all of this. But you look at UCF, and I think the alumni base that I've read is massive. Uh, you look at Houston as well. Cincinnati is already becoming a football power with Luke Fickle. 
you know, and then BYU, you know, I think all those being really strong football schools, I just look at the PAC 12 and like Jed fish at Arizona. It's like, okay, could he get that program back on the tracks? Yes. But is that a needle mover? Same thing with Arizona state. They've got the NCAA issues with Herm Edwards. Those can resolve themselves. And so I think you're right. Like it's going to come down to Notre Dame, Oregon, Washington. I think those will make their kind of decisions that they can get to the big 10 or we'll see what Notre Dame does. But I think after that, then we'll be looking at it and like of a time frame. You know, I think we talked about this a little bit before we jumped on, but I guess, do you see this being another kind of, Hey, every July conference realignment is going to pop off. Like how do you see this playing out in terms of a timetable? Is this going to happen in the middle of a season? Like how do you see this going? So looking at uh, the all of the confluence of factors, right? I, I think that you have to look at the 2024 Pac-12 deadline, uh, when, when their contract expires, the 2025 deadline when the Big 12s expires. I, I think that Notre Dame's is, is also 2025, right? So we have all of these things coming at the same time, along with the college football playoff contract expiring. So there's going to be some kind of new uh, system in 2026. So if you're wondering why things have been so crazy as of late, it's because of that. It's because all these things are coming to a head at the same time. And so... I don't think that we're going to have this every year. I think that this is going to be something maybe for the next year or two we have some of. But after that, it's the ACC contract in 2036. And I think there's going to be kind of a stalemate at that point. Now, I'm going to be curious because I, I do feel like there's a chance that almost all of these uh, these conferences, the playoff, uh, you know, whatever else, that they set up contracts to basically go through that 2035, 2036 mm -hmm. range. And we might hit this again in 2036, you know, and uh, I can deal with that when I'm in my 40s. But uh, but I think that uh, I think that for right now, there's a lot of these things happening at the same time. When you talk about timelines, Notre Dame is in no rush. Notre Dame knows they're not going to be left behind no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so I think from Notre Dame's perspective, the biggest factor to take into account right now is the playoff. What does the playoff look like? Yes, you know, there's obviously been the reports of Notre Dame seeking $75 million in a television contract. But I think more than that, uh, that's going to be a big part of it. But more than that, they want to make sure that they have not just access, but legitimate good access to the national stage, to the college football playoff, to being a top five team, to being a national title contender. Uh, obviously, they've done such a great job on the recruiting trail that they, they, you know, they want to leverage it into competing for national championships. So I think that that's going to be the biggest factor for Notre Dame. If they feel like the Big Ten and SEC are trying to lock them out, then I think that they'll probably join the Big Ten. But if not, I think that they could go for another 10 years uh, and reevaluate in 2036. So I think that I'm probably more optimistic at this point that Notre Dame is going to stay independent than I did when all of this started. Mm. And if that's the case, I think that Washington and Oregon probably, at least for the next little while, commit to the Pac-12 and say, you know, we'd rather stick together. We'd rather. And then I think that that potentially has a, a domino effect down to those four corner schools. Now, anything can happen. Like we saw last year, Texas and Oklahoma make their decision and boom, everything's all over the place. So anything can change any moment. But I think at this point, I'm probably a little bit more bullish on the idea that the Big 12 might stay kind of pat at this moment and that the Pac-12 might kind of stick with 10 teams and maybe add two more as well at this moment. And then maybe we kind of push that uh, that deadline of trying to work through some of these issues out to the 2030s when, again, when the ACC contract expires, I think it's chaos, right? I think that it's uh, whether it's a feeding frenzy, whether it's people getting left behind, I think we're going to figure out at that point. But I do think that we might be more like a couple years away from the biggest dominoes of this really finally falling. Uh, and we might kind of reach some sort of a stalemate between the Big 12 and Pac-12 at this point. But you know, the other part of this, too, is that I think that if you are one of the four corner schools, Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, Utah, you're looking and you're wondering, man, if, if we have to get in with Oregon and Washington, two teams who are open about the fact that they are desperate to leave for more money. Mm -hmm. I think that that could be a domino as well. Right. It could be a domino where they don't want to 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 be at risk of being left behind. And because the reality is if Oregon and Washington leave a new Pac-12 after they've signed a contract, that league's done for, right? Like it's it's not a power league in any way anymore. So I think that, uh, that that's the other side of this is that one of these schools could decide that they want to be the proactive one and move on. But, you know, again, it's uh, it's going to be 
a lot of individuals making a lot of individual decisions that could have giant consequences. 100%. And that's a great way to wrap it up that we're just going to have to see with a lot of the, the conference realignment stuff. And it, as fast as these things moved over the last, you know, 13 months, it does seem like we're in a little bit more now of a, all right, now we need to let some cards fall and, and see where they fall and Notre Dame be kind of the biggest one there. So, all right, Jayon, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks a bunch for coming on. Where can everyone that's wanting to look to read some of your stuff, find you, where can they do all that? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You can find all my work at cbssports.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Shahan J. Araja. And you can also listen to my podcast, The College Football Survivor Show, where we talk playoff, but we do it in kind of a different way. We don't just kind of talk about Alabama all the time. We like to look at how all the factors are affecting college football. So make sure and follow us there at CFB Survivor Show. Perfect. Thanks so much, Shahan. Thank you for having me.